splinting technique that you can use, another material that you can use if you don't have an Insulite closed cell foam pad, is you can actually use an air mattress to create kind of an air splint technique that's improvised using this inflatable mattress. So very similar to how we did it with the Insulite pad, I can make an actual immobilizer with this by adding some rigidity to that. I can add sticks to that. Just be, uh, be aware of any sharp points or anything on those sticks or any other splitting material that you're using that can poke through this and compromise the integrity of the air mattress because then it won't work. So if you do have something like this, it's a good idea to make sure all of it is smooth. And if it's not, you can use tape, you can use uh, padding, you can do whatever you have to do to take away the sharpness or the pointiness that's going to poke through this mattress before you put it on there. Um, and probably it goes without saying, but if you don't have sticks available, there are other things that you can use. Anything that is rigid, like a trekking pole, if you're using hiking staffs or trekking poles, you could use those. Uh, but again, same principle applies. Make sure there's no sharp things that are going to compromise the integrity of that mattress. Uh, so if I wanted to do this and completely immobilize this knee, then I would add these sticks to this technique. Uh, if I wanted to do just the brace, which is what I want to do in this case, what I'm going to do is wrap this up. And keep in mind, this is deflated right now. I'm going to bring this up around his knee. Let's bring this a little more this way. There we go. Bring that up around his knee. And I'm going to loosely tie that to kind of hold it in place where I want it. Make sure we got a good wrap. Probably a little tighter than it needed to be. There we go. Picking up a lot of sticks here. We got one extra here. I'm going to slide that up underneath here. There we go. Knees right there. I want two above and two below. Now I've loosely tied those on, and remember this is deflated. At this point, I'm going to open up the valve and I'm gonna inflate this with air to take out all of those voids and provide that compression rigidity. So it's kind of an improvised air splint. So this part takes a little bit of wind, so I don't recommend it if you're a smoker. So once you get it blown up, you've added some air and some compression in there, some compression rigidity. And if you want more or less function, you just increase the air input into that. Or again, you could add rigidity and completely immobilize it by adding some padded sticks. But this is an immobilizer at this point because he still has a little bit of function, but it's very well supported function with that air splint. So that is an improvised knee immobilizer or knee brace using an inflatable air mattress. All right, so the goals with any of these splints that we're trying to do, the goal is to prevent any further injury. The secondary goal to that being to regain mobility. All right, so where this differs from like an EMS injury or something on, on a, you know, a soccer field or the gym is you're not going to have help. You still need to walk out. So there are a couple things that you'll do differently um, than you would normally. But the goal is always to prevent further injury and regain that mobility so that you can self-rescue uh, and we can walk out if possible. If not, then you need to set up some signals and wait for rescue and stabilize the injury as best you can. So those are the goals. As far as the principles of splinting that we're going to apply to all the splints that we do, first is if you can and if you have another person available, uh, that would be a good thing to do, but maybe you don't, uh, manually stabilizing that injury should be the first thing you do. 
you know, especially for a brake, manually stabilize that to prevent injury while you get a more, uh, a more permanent intervention in there, or at least a semi-permanent intervention in with a splint, you know, so manually stabilizing it is the first principle. After that, the second principle is to splint this in a position of function or at least a position of comfort. So the position of function, meaning, you know, for the hand would be a uh, kind of a kung fu grip like they used to have on GI Joe. And for the position of function for the ankle would be a 90 degree angle here. Position of function for the knee is kind of relaxed at that point right there. So position of function, if there is no position of function, then at least a position of comfort that's most comfortable to the person that you're working on. And keep in mind these principles apply to working on yourself as well. Uh, you just, instead of doing it on another person, you do the same thing on yourself. Uh, so position of function, position of comfort. It also needs to be accessible. Right? It needs to be accessible for checking what's called CMS. Right? CMS stands for circulation, motor, and sensory. So for circulation, the easiest thing to do is just check capillary refill. But because this is a remote wilderness emergency, <coughs> bug, but because it's a remote wilderness emergency, he still needs to walk out, right? Whatever terrain, whatever environment you went through to get to where you are now, you have to go back through that to get out. So we're gonna leave the footwear in place whenever possible to protect his feet as we're leaving. And I lost my train of thought now that that bug came. Capillary? <laughs> yeah, so capillary refill is the easiest way to check that. Just push on the nail bed and it, it'll turn white and it should refill by the time you can say capillary refill. If you can't reach that, you can also check pedal pulses. If you don't know where those are, then research that now before you ever need it. But I know that there's one right behind the inside of the ankle bone. I should be able to feel his arterial pulse. And I do have that. Now, if you don't have any of that, then checking the motor function and the sensory function, it's reasonable to expect that if he has a motor function and sensory function, that he also has circulation to that limb. And you want it to be accessible before and after because you need to assess it to make sure that all of that is present and functioning before you put a splint on and you also need to be able to reassess it afterwards to make sure you didn't uh, cause any kind of detrimental thing to this to where you interfered with the circulation motor or century of that injury. So we're checking for circulation either with a cap refill or checking a pulse and that's good. When you're checking for motor function depending on the extent and the type of the injury if you can do a full motor test, that's fine, but if you can't, it may be something as simple as wiggling your toes, right? He's got motor function all the way down to the very end of this extremity. If he can tolerate it, you can check motor function by having them push forward, like on a gas pedal, and then pull back, all right? So motor function is intact, and he may not be able to tolerate that depending on the injury here. So that's checking your motor function. And then as far as sensory, you don't want him to cheat on this and just tell you what you're pointing at. So you have them look away and you touch a side of the foot, either one. Which side of your foot is this? Right side. Or then maybe pick a toe and touch that. Which toe is this? Big toe. Big toe. Okay, so we know he has sensory function in this and we want to make sure he still has that after the fact. So the other principle of splinting is accessible for checking and rechecking your CMS. Another thing that we want to do is, depending on where the injury is, we want to make sure that we secure above and below, basically isolating that injury in the middle and supporting it on both ends. So securing it above and below the injury or the joint is another key principle. After that, we're really getting into padded, rigid, and adjustable as the things that you want to apply as far as principles of splinting. So for padding, in this case, he's got low cut footwear on, so I've just added some gauze padding here around any bony prominences. And those bony prominences in this case is where the ankle bones are. If this injury came up to here, I would pad the sides of the knee. Anywhere that the splinting material is going to come in contact with a bony area is going to be painful for them. And our goal is to make this less painful so that we can walk out. So you want to pad. And then as far as rigidity, we talked about during the gear portion of this, we talked about the SAM splint. And this is what they look like folded up. They're nice and flat. But this is a rigid splint that's basically kind of a sheet of moldable aluminum with some foam padding over top of that and you can mold this into several different configurations to fit the injury. 
The other key thing with these is that they're actually radio lucent. So you can leave this on when we finally get back and we go to the emergency room uh, to get this checked out. He's gonna need an x-ray to determine the extent of the injury. They can x-ray right through this. So that's why I prefer these because they're very lightweight, very packable, moldable to a multitude of injuries and the radio lucent. So it's a splint that can stay on when you get to the emergency room as well. So with these, to add rigidity to those, what we do is what's called a C curve. Right? So we're just kind of curving it into a C to conform around the patient's leg or the patient's arm. That provides some rigidity. And then if we needed to, we can add additional rigidity by going on what's called a reverse C curve and kind of crimping up the edge of that. So now instead of just the C curve, we've got a reverse C curve, C curve, reverse C curve. That adds even more strength to this, just depends on what you need as far as stabilizing this injury. So with the first technique, it's a simple ankle stirrup that works really well for an ankle injury, providing support so they can hopefully walk out. I've placed my C curves in about two thirds of the way down. And when you're shaping this to determine where it's gonna go, I want it to be centered basically right here on the bottom of the foot and come right up both sides of the ankle. So I can use that leg to determine where that is, or I can use the uninjured leg if it's too painful to do that. I could also use my own leg to kind of pre-shape this. So I set that stirrup just forward of his heel right here and I'm gonna crimp whatever I need to crimp to make that conform to his foot. And this is why I only came about two thirds of the way down on both sides with my C-curve, is because if you put your C-curves down here, it's too much rigidity, you can't form it around the foot as well. So that'll come right up the side of the ankle. And this part you can kind of adjust as necessary to fit perfectly around his footwear, his ankle, and his lower leg. Once that's in place, you're going to secure it. So I'm just going to use an ace wrap. I could use tape, I could use Coban, I could use a number of different things to secure this. And typically because we want to capture and stabilize below and above, I would wrap this around in its entirety to capture underneath and wrap it all the way up here. But because he's going to be walking out on this and this is an elastic bandage, it's not going to be long before he walks right through this and the whole thing loosens up. I'm going to have to redo it anyway, and I may be limited on resources and supplies. So what I'm going to do is capture just above without going on the very bottom. But if this person wasn't walking wounded and you were waiting for rescue, then go ahead and secure it around the bottom to capture all of it and stabilize it a little better. But I'm not going to do that in this case because we want to walk out. So I'll take that ace wrap. Start as low as you can without putting it on the bottom. Capture that and put tension on it. You don't want to put it so tight that it cuts circulation off, obviously. And I find that for most of my lower extremity injuries, one or two six inch elastic bandages work great for pretty much anything that I need to do. All right, go ahead and lower that down. And I'll secure that bandage off. And take a look at your work, see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted. And then of course, recheck, because we put an intervention on, recheck your CMS. In this case, I can't reach that pedal pulse anymore. His footwear's still on because he needs to walk out, so I can't check the capillary refill, but it's reasonable to believe that if he has motor function, go ahead and wiggle your toes. All right, which side of your foot is this? Oh, right side. And what side is this? Right side. It's both sides. Oh, both sides. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Trick question. Trick question. But he still has motor function and sensory, so it's reasonable to expect he still has circulation. And we can try to walk out with this simple ankle stirrup made from a SAM splint. Of course, I'm going to readjust this going back to the padded rigid adjustable 
I'm going to adjust this as needed. If we go 100 meters down the road and it, it starts to slide or it's not providing the support it needs, we'll stop, reassess it, redo it. And that's one reason I like the elastic wrap or the elastic bandages because it's easily adjustable. And we're going to apply those same principles to all the splints that we do. So this is a simple ankle stirrup for an ankle injury.